Well, hey, good morning. Good to see you. I want to welcome everybody outside as well, everybody online. Thanks for being a part of this today. My name is James. Uh, if you were here, let me start by saying this. If you were here last week with Pastor Hosanna, uh, wasn't that just an awesome Sunday? She had a great message. Um, you don't need to clap for her. She's not here. Like, uh, no, but it was, it was actually a great message. She talked about the way of identity and learning to see ourselves the way God does by the names he puts on us that we are chosen, we are free, we are forgiven, we are temples of the Holy Spirit. And then the message kind of culminated with this like spoken word piece she did. It was awesome. And everything in the service was great until the part where she said, I would give a spoken word piece this week. <laughs> Challenge accepted. Okay, so you ready? Here we go. Now. This is a story all about how my life got flipped, turned upside down. And I'd like to take a moment, just sit right there. And I'll tell you how I became the prince of a town called Bel Air. All right. That's all I got. That's all I got. You don't, you don't have to give me a sympathy clap for that. But you know, you all wanted to go in West Philadelphia, right? We'll just, let's just stop right there. Uh, we're beginning a new series today uh, called Pillars. And the idea of a pillar is that a pillar can be a person or a thing that is reliable, that holds something up. So a pillar can uh, literally be something that holds up a roof or an overhang uh, that you know, uh, is, a, is a structural support. A pillar can also be a person. Have you ever heard anybody say about someone, oh, they're a pillar in this community. Right? They're, they're a pillar in this company. What does that mean? Uh, what it means is that they are reliable, that they're somebody that that community or organization can count on, that they're essential. And so what we're doing in this little five-week series as we continue our Ways of Jesus theme this year, which by the way, if you're new, we've been on a year-long spiritual journey as a church into the ways of Jesus. Well, we are learning the very clear commands of Christ that are found in the New Testament. And there's uh, 49 of them. And so each weekend, we're looking at a different clear command of Christ because Jesus wants his people not to just think certain things and believe certain things, but he wants his people to live in very specific ways. And so over the next five weeks, we're going to look at five of these ways that are pillars. They're essential to our faith. We're going to look at the way of integrity, the way of service, the way of self-control, the way of discernment. And today, we're calling this the way of confidence, the way of confidence. Uh, this idea comes from a section of scripture in Matthew chapter 10. We're going to look at five verses. We're going to read it in its entirety. This is the way of Jesus we're going to look at today. Uh, and then we'll kind of work our way through it. So here we go. Matthew chapter 10, verse 26 to 31. These are the words of Jesus. He said, but don't be afraid of those who threaten you for the time is coming when everything that is covered will be revealed and all that is secret will be made known to all. What I tell you now in the darkness, shout abroad when daybreak comes. What I whisper in your ear, shout from the housetops for all to hear. Don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot touch your soul. Fear only God, who can destroy both soul and body in hell. What is the price of two sparrows? One copper coin. But not a single sparrow can fall to the ground without your father knowing it. And the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. Now, Jesus is saying a lot here. And to help us understand it, the first thing I want to do is give you the context. Who is Jesus saying this to? And what are the circumstances they are in? Because I think it'll help make sense of what Jesus said. So if you're taking notes, here's the context. Jesus is speaking to his disciples, his closest 12 that he invited to follow and learn. He's speaking to his disciples about persecution when they stand for him in public. That's the context of what Jesus is speaking about. If you go back and start at the beginning of Matthew chapter 10, uh, Jesus gathers the 12 disciples and he is about to send them out 
for the very first time on their own to do ministry. What that means is up till this point, they have followed Jesus. They have heard Jesus teach about the kingdom of God. They've watched Jesus lay hands on sick people and see them be healed. And now Jesus says, I'm sending you out for the first time on your own to do what you've watched me do. I want you to go and preach about the kingdom of God. And I'm giving you the power and the authority to heal the sick. And so imagine it's like the first time they're about to do this. And it's almost like you can read into like the apprehension that Jesus feels from them, right? Because they've seen Jesus teach, but they've also seen not everybody receives what Jesus is putting out. Not not everybody believes what Jesus says. They've watched Jesus heal people and they've watched the religious elite in Jewish society basically write off Jesus' healings as well. He's possessed by the devil. That's why he can do that. And so they've seen not everybody believes and receives when Jesus teaches and even when Jesus heals. And so they're thinking, well, if they don't receive and believe Jesus, (laughs) what's gonna happen to us? And so this is not a hypothetical situation where Jesus says, hey, don't be afraid of those who threaten you. He's telling them, you're about to go out and people are probably gonna threaten you (laughs) because they don't like what you're saying. They don't like what you're doing. That's the context of what's happening here. He's getting ready to send them out for the first time and they're, they're a little nervous and maybe Jesus is too. Maybe Jesus is too. And that got me thinking about Uh, As I was studying this week for the message, everything my wife and I are feeling and thinking as we're about to drop off our oldest at college for the first time this week. Um, And she's going to be going to the University of Kansas. That's why I'm wearing the little Jayhawk here. So I'm like, why does he have a bird on his? That's not the sign for the Holy Spirit, is it? Like, no, that's Rock Chalk Jayhawk. I'm learning all this stuff. Uh, But as my daughter is getting ready to go to school for the first time, if you're a parent, you've done this, you've done like the college drop off. Uh, for, for one of your kids, and it's kind of the first time they're out, um, you're probably familiar with all these thoughts and feelings. I'm not, okay? It's, I'm a first-timer here. And so over the last, uh, you know, really since her high school graduation a couple months ago, here's, I feel like there's just this countdown clock in my head that I'm like, oh, it's coming. And I, I have this constant feeling, I'm like, is she ready? Have we done enough? Have I told her enough? Have I talked about all the scenarios that she needs to be ready for? And then because I am that dad, anytime I think of something uh, that I'm like, oh, she needs to know this. Like I'll send her a text. Um, I've started following like five different people on Instagram that are like 10 things you need to know for every college freshman. Um, And if you know how Instagram works, they send you more of what you look at. And so now I'm following all these people. They're like, the 10 things you need to know for moving into the dorm. I mean, and all this stuff is really helpful. Um, Although my daughter might say, Dad, can you send me less of these? Is probably what she would say. Because I see them and I'm like, ooh, watch this and then let's get together and talk about point number three. Because there's some good information in there. I want to make sure you know. Because I'm nervous, right? It's like the first time she's going away. She's going to be a student athlete. I'm like, you got a lot to manage. You got practice. You got school. You got all this kind of stuff. And so I'm a little nervous about it. This is the context of the words that Jesus has given his disciples. It's the first time he's sending them out on their own. And they're a little nervous about it. Because they, they're knowing not everybody's going to receive what Jesus is telling us. And here's the reality if you're gonna be a Jesus follower. Not everybody's gonna receive. Not everybody's gonna believe. Not everybody's going to like when we stand for truth, when we stand for righteousness. And when that happens, when we maybe face some persecution, when we face some trouble in our life, when we face some difficulty in our circumstance, What Jesus is saying in this passage of scripture today is that we need to have an eternal lens to see persecution, to understand trouble, and to make sense of our problems. That we need to see through an eternal lens that we have a God who is with us and for us, and we should fear him more than we fear circumstances. And I'm going to talk about what proper fear of the Lord really means in just a moment. But that's what Jesus is saying. But for a lot of us, when we face trouble or persecution or even just difficult circumstances, rather than surrendering those things to Christ, we end up surrendering to our fear. And whenever we surrender to our fear in those situations, 
we can fall into the two most common reactions to when trouble or persecution or difficulty comes to our life. And here's what they are, if you're taking notes. It's the what ifs and the if onlys. You ever fall trapped to the what ifs and the if onlys? Let me give you a definition of what these are. The, the, the what if uh, looks to the future and worries about what could happen. And every time you look to the future and you're worried about what could happen, it produces anxiety. I don't mean clinical anxiety. I'm talking about uh, just, you know, worries and fear, anxiousness. That's what we're talking about. Because when, when there is an uncertain future and we choose to fill in the blank with the what ifs, right? Like, like there's some area of our life that we're not sure how it's going to go. It's a new school. It's a new experience a new job, or we just lost our job, a relationship that doesn't feel as stable as it used to be, the finances are in a difficult place, somebody gets bad news about their health. And in that moment, the what ifs can take over. Well, what if I don't make friends? What if I don't like it? What if it doesn't go as well as I hoped? What if I can't find a new job? What if the money runs out? What if I don't get better? What if they don't get well? And as a result, the what ifs always produce the same thing, worry, fear, anxiousness. They rob us of being present in the moment and we become so afraid of what might be and it hasn't happened yet. The money hasn't run out. We have a chance to get better. We don't know what's gonna happen at that new job, but when we let the what ifs, they ruin our present joy. And what if has a fraternal twin? Um, it, it shares DNA, but it looks different. And that is the if only. And here's what the if onlys are. If only looks to the past and grumbles about what has happened. This is when it doesn't go well. And whenever that, it produces anger. I mean, it causes us to get angry about what did or didn't happen, about the outcome we had hoped for that we never got. You ever play the if only game? Man, if only I knew then what I know now, right? If only I could turn back time. Some of you are singing a Cher song in your head right now. Stop it. All right? If you even know who Cher is, that means you're old. All right? You... If only I could remake that decision. If only God wouldn't have let that happen to me, to them. We've all done this. We've looked back when trouble or difficulty comes our way when we didn't get what we hoped for, when we didn't get what we prayed for. And we say, man, if only. But what do we do when we come face to face with fear? Because it's real, right? Like, like what do we do in those moments that there is uncertainty, that we did get a bad report from the doctor and we don't know how it's gonna go? Or we do realize that the job isn't going the way that we had hoped or we had prayed. Or the finances aren't where we need them to be. Like, like, what do we do in those very real moments? Well, Jesus tells us. Jesus tells us what we do when we face trouble or persecution, when we come face to face with difficulties in life. And here's the first thing that Jesus said. This is the cure. The cure is that the first one is we need to learn how to fear the Lord, not the things of this world. Or another way to say it would be we need to fear the Lord more then we fear the things of this world. Now, when I say fear the Lord, probably 95% of us have a wrong understanding, a misunderstanding of what that means. Because when I say fear of the Lord, you might hear be very scared of the Lord. Right? Be very, very scared of the Lord because he sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. Oh yes, he knows if you've been bad or good, so what? Be good for goodness sake, right? Some of you, your image of God is like he's a mean Santa Claus. I mean, at least Santa Claus usually gives you something good once a year. What has God ever done for you? Right? And so maybe because of the church background you grew up in, maybe because of things that you experienced, because of, of, of things that parents even said, like you grew up and that's kind of your image of God. Like he's just waiting for you to mess up so he can punish you. And so when you read or see the idea of fear of the Lord, you're like, yep, I got that one down. <laughs> Be very, very scared of the Lord. But biblical fear of the Lord is not being scared 
of the Lord. Because when you're scared of something, let me ask you this question. Does it cause you to run towards it or run away from it? Run away. Makes me think of my daughter when she was, um, you know, kind of like preschool age, uh, three, four, uh, five years old. Um, in, in that little window, um, we had Disney passes. Uh, this is, you know, 15 years ago or so, back when they were like $100, $150 for the SoCal Select Pass. Now I think that cost $8,000. For you to have the SoCal Select. The SoCal Select Pass, you can never go in December or summer or weekends, but you can go on Tuesdays. <laughs> and so, like, we went on Tuesdays during all the crappy times for a few years, and it was really fun. It was like good family memories for the most part. But we discovered my daughter was deathly afraid of characters that had masks or, like, just big, you know, like, you know, fake heads that they'd put on. She could handle the princesses or the princes or any character that had a normal person face. But as soon as Mickey, Minnie, you know, it, it didn't matter who it was, like Pluto, anybody that had like a fake face, she would freak out. And we found this out because one of the first times we went, we went with friends, we stayed overnight and they were like, let's go to a character breakfast. And so like $837 later, <laughs> where we could get, you know, two pancakes and a piece of bacon and orange juice, and Winnie the Pooh walks out, um, we found out she's deathly afraid because whenever a character would come out, she would, I mean, blood curling scream, go under the table, try to run out of the restaurant. Yes, we were the parents with that kid, right? Where everybody's like, get that kid under control over there. You know, and, and we were so committed because we spent so much money. I was like, we're not leaving. <laughs> like... You know, she's screaming, and I'm like, hey, you're going to drink that $80 orange juice right now. <laughs> like, we're, last sip, you better get that down. But she wanted nothing to do with them. Why? Because she was scared of them. When you are scared of something, you're trying to get away. Does God want us to be scared of him? Absolutely not. Because everything he has done for humanity since the beginning of time is to make it easy for us to run back into a relationship with him. He's not trying to have us be scared of him and stay at arm's length. He's trying us to get us to run towards him, to receive his grace and his forgiveness and his power and his strength and his peace and the new life he promises and so understand when you see the fear of the Lord in the Bible, and it's a mega theme in scripture. It's in scripture from the beginning of the story to the end, that we are supposed to have this fear of the Lord. If it doesn't mean be scared of the Lord, what does it mean? Well, I'm glad you asked. Here's what it means. Go ahead and put up this definition on the screen. It is a joyful awe and wonder before the greatness of who God is and what he has done. That's what biblical fear of the Lord is. It is a joyful awe and wonder. Does that sound scary? No. Think of the last time that you had, just leave that definition up for a minute. Think of the last time you had a joyful awe and wonder at something where you were like, wow, that's amazing. That's incredible. I mean, was it at a sunset? A sunrise, probably not a sunrise because you're here at 11, okay? You haven't seen a sunrise. You know, the people at the last service, they're sunrise people, all right? The people at the next service, they're hangover people. That's why they come at one o'clock, okay? But when was the last time you, you had like a, oh, that's amazing. That's incredible. That's what the fear of the Lord is. Wow. The creator of the universe that created all of this, he did this so he could be in a relationship with us, that I'm loved by him, that everything that he has done has been so that I can be forgiven and restored back into a relationship, that the one who is all powerful, all knowing, like he knows me, he cares about me, out of the billions of people that are on this planet. He loves and cares about me. And he created us body, soul, and spirit to live with him forever. Wow. That's who God is. You see, that's what the fear of the Lord is. And as a result, it shouldn't make us want to need to run away from God. It should cause us to run to him. 
cause us to run to him. So when Jesus says in verse 28, let's look at it again. Jesus said, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot touch your soul. And then let's say the next three words out loud. Everybody ready, go. Fear only God. Say it again. Fear only God who can destroy both soul and body. Jesus was not saying that to his disciples to scare them. He was saying it to set them free. He was saying, if you stand up for me and you, you live the gospel, you teach the gospel, you live for truth and righteousness, not everybody's going to receive that. And, 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 and in, in the context of Matthew 10, Jesus even says, hey, if they call me Beelzebub, it was like a, a name of a demon. He's like, Jesus is like, if they call me that, what do you think they're going to call you? He's basically telling them not everything's going to go awesome all the time. But Jesus isn't saying fear only God to scare them. He's saying it to set them free because here's what Jesus is doing. Everybody look right here and don't miss it. It's the whole point of, the, of, of this passage. Jesus is trying to help them right size their fears. He's basically saying don't have a fear of man that is greater than your fear of God. Let your fear of God inform the fears in your life. That's what Jesus is teaching. He's basically saying, filter your fears through your faith that says, I have an amazing God who knows me, who loves me, who will not forsake me even when I go through the worst this broken world can throw at me. Like I have a God who is with me in all of it. And so when bad things happen, when I face a struggle, when brokenness hits my life and my family, when sickness comes, it's not because we've done something wrong. It's because this world is broken and not yet redeemed and restored. But I have a savior who is with me and who is working to someday redeem and restore all things. In other words, that's the joyful all in wonder. It's having an eternal perspective and putting in the things of this life, putting those under the umbrella of the fear of the Lord. That's what this is talking about. It's having an eternal perspective. Look what it says in Proverbs 9, 10 about the fear of the Lord. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of, say it out loud, wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is what? Understanding. What this verse is saying is very significant. It's saying that recognizing who God is, is the very foundation of wisdom and understanding. It's saying what you believe about God informs what you believe and understand about the world. What you believe about God informs how you see yourself, how you make sense of what we experience. That how you view God is actually the launching pad for everything else in life. That's the claim of that scripture. And so before we go to the next point, here's my question for you today. Do you maybe need to right-size your fear of the Lord? Has maybe your fear of your circumstances been greater than your fear of the Lord? Is maybe the fear of the unknown going on in your career right now or your business, has that superseded your fear of the Lord? Is, is the financial realities that you're in right now consumed you more than the fear of the Lord? Is the uncertainty about that relationship consumed you more than the fear of the Lord? And do you need to right-size that and say, you know what? I need to fear God more than I do these other things. That doesn't say that you're not living in reality. Being a Jesus follower isn't that we ignore reality. And people are like, how's it going? And you're like, blessed. And in reality, you're not blessed. Life sucks right now, right? There's brokenness in relationship. There's financial stress. The job isn't going the way you had hoped or prayed, right? Like you don't go, oh, I'm blessed. You're like, man, I'm, I'm hurting right now. I'm struggling right now. But I know God is good. I know God loves me. I know he's given me a community that I can lean on when I'm going through a difficult time and that I'm not alone through it. You see, that's the promise of the Jesus follower. If you read scripture, if anybody ever sold you that following Jesus means everything just goes awesome all the time, like that's not what's in scripture. The promise of the Jesus follower is that we are forgiven and free through Christ, that we don't have to earn his love. We don't have to earn his grace. We can just receive it and live in it. And it means that when the brokenness of this world hits us, that we have a God who walks with us through it. And he gives us a community called the church so we don't have to walk through it alone. I was just at a funeral 
uh, on Friday um, for a father member of our church. And in those moments, here's what I'm reminded of as I walk into those as a pastor. There's no magic prayers. There's no magic, you know, words that I can say that it's like, oh, this is going to put it all in perspective and everybody's going to have peace. Like, like, that's not what this is about. But here's what I do know as a pastor. I can walk with anybody in our church through anything and go, you know what? You don't have to be alone and go through that. God's with you. His presence is real. I'm here. He's giving you a community to journey through those feelings of grief and all those things. And we have the promise of eternity with him forever. And that the brokenness and hurt we have here doesn't last forever. That's what this Jesus life is about. That's why fear of the Lord, a, a amazing, joyful, all in wonder of who God is and what he has done should supersede any of the fears we have in this world. That's what Jesus is teaching them. And then the second thing is this. Jesus says, if you're facing fear, trouble, persecution, what do you do? Know how valuable you are to God. So fear the Lord more than you do the things of this world. And then secondly, just know how valuable you are to God. At the end of our section of scripture in Matthew chapter 10, it's almost like Jesus takes a left turn and you're like, where is he going with this? He starts talking about sparrows. Did you catch that? Like, you're just like, what in the world? He's like, hey, well, you all know how much a sparrow is. Um, why would Jesus say that? Well, he's talking to first century Jewish young men. And most of them lived, grew up in Jerusalem. This is the center, the holy city for Jewish people. And the practice in Judaism at that time was they would go to the temple and offer sacrifices for their sins and for worship. But if you were poor and you didn't have enough money to buy a goat or a lamb that could be sacrificed, an acceptable sacrifice for the poor, for the average everyday person, was a sparrow. You could purchase a sparrow for just a copper coin, what we would call today a penny. And that was an acceptable sacrifice. And so Jesus says, hey, you, you all know how much a sparrow is. And everybody would have been like, well, yeah, yeah, yeah you know, it's not that much money. And Jesus is like, you are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. Now, again, that doesn't hit us because that's not our context. So if Jesus were telling this to us, I think he might say something like this. You all know how much a gallon of gas is, right? <laughs> and we would all go, way too much, right? Like it's over $5 now. Like why? This is insane. Do you know gas is cheaper in the middle of Manhattan, New York than it is Chula Vista, California? Like what is wrong with us in this state? Anyway, none of that's in the sermon. That's just my own rant, okay? Like why is that so expensive? Um, but yeah, well, here's what Jesus would say. You all know how much a gallon of gas is, right? And then he, you, you would say, yeah, it's over $5. And then Jesus would look at you and say, you're more valuable than a whole refinery of gasoline. And we don't go, man, that's billions of dollars. And Jesus would go, yeah, you matter to me more than that. That's what Jesus is saying here. And maybe you're here and you would go, you know what? I don't feel very valuable to God right now. Maybe because of some trouble that you're currently facing in your life, or maybe just because of some failures in your past. Maybe you look at a failed marriage or where you are in your career and you go, man, this isn't where I wanted to be. It's not where I used to be. Maybe you look at some things that were done to you or said about you and you look back at your personal experiences. You would say, you know what? Because of those things, I just don't feel very valuable right now. Too many of us let our past experiences determine our value. And if you've had some disappointments or failures or hurts in your past, everybody look right here. God does not value you any less because of your past. He wants to forgive it. He wants to redeem it and even use it as part of the beautiful story that he tells about his goodness and grace. That's what God wants to do. You want to know how valuable you are to God? Let's look at our last verse. Here's the last scripture we're going to look at today. 1 Corinthians 7, 23. Could we all read this out loud together? Everybody in the room, everybody outside, everybody at home. 1 Corinthians 7, 23 in our nice outside voices. Ready, begin. You have been bought and paid for by Christ. So you belong to him. That's how valuable you are. You see, what makes value in something 
is who owns it and what they are willing to pay for it. That's what makes value, not past experiences. And this scripture tells us that God paid for you with the most valuable thing that he had, Jesus. He bankrupted all of heaven and sent Jesus to become one of us so ultimately he could show us what love looks like and he could become the perfect sacrifice for our sins. And we can all be forgiven if we believe and receive. And then now we are in the family of God. What did that scripture say? We belong to him. That's what your value is based on. Not what was done to you, not how well that job went, not how much money you're making right now, not what somebody did or what somebody said. Your value is based on what God is willing to pay. And he's willing to pay everything. That's how valuable you are. Let me give you an example of this truth that values based on who owns it and what's they're willing to pay. Because some of you are like, you're starting to believe it, but you don't really believe it yet. So I'm going to show you two pictures that are a little compare and contrast of value based on who owned it and what someone's willing to pay. Here's the first picture. This is 1981 seventh grade basketball team in Carlinville, Illinois. Can you find yours truly in there? Number 45, baby. Power forward machine. Let's go. Now, some of you are judging. You're like, hey, why are you in 55? That's my buddy Stevie right there. Stevie Vaughn. Why do you guys not have the name of the jerseys on there? Well, that's because we were too big for the other jerseys. which I've still had to go to counseling for ever since seventh grade. (laughs) Now, let's say I had that jersey, right? That polyester, no elasticity in it, you know, like chafe you wearing it, seventh grade jersey from 1986. Let's say I had that jersey. Would you give me five bucks for it? No, okay, five bucks, I got one. Like, my mom might be willing to pay 10, all right? so. My mom's in the lead. She's probably watching online. Um, Like, yeah, it's not worth very much. Why? Because I owned it, right? And like my basketball gear is not a big resale value because what creates value is who owned it and what are people willing to pay? So maybe my mom would pay $10. Now, let me show you another picture. This is from 1981 in Wilmington, North Carolina, Lanny High School JV team. That little number 12, right in the middle. Anybody guess who number 12 is? That's pre-puberty Michael Jordan. That's not six foot six Skywalker guy. That's five foot nine cut from the varsity team guy. That's who that is. Now, go ahead and take that picture down. Let's say I had that jersey up here today. (laughs) Who's giving me five bucks? Who's giving me a hundred bucks? Who's easily given me a thousand bucks? Yeah, because that would be an amazing investment because one of his college jerseys that he wore in a game sold for $114,000. Could you imagine if you had his little junior high jersey? I bet you I could at least get 20 out of that. $20,000, maybe 50, who knows? So what's the difference between my 45 (laughs) and Michael Jordan's 12? Everything is different, right? Because of who owned it and what people are willing to pay. You are so valuable to God that he bankrupted all of heaven for you. Sending Christ to die in your place. You belong to God. And this is the way of confidence. Our confidence as a Jesus follower, when we face persecution, when we face trouble, when we face difficulty, it doesn't come from our strength. It doesn't come from our power. It doesn't come from our ability to just grit and tough it out and suck it up and get through it. No, we have a confidence because as Jesus people, we have an eternal perspective that no matter what persecution or trouble we face, we choose to fear the Lord more than we do the things of this world. It doesn't mean we don't live in reality. We embrace reality. But we have a Savior who embraces us in that reality because we know how valuable we are to him. We're gonna receive communion to remember how valuable we are. 
that God bankrupted heaven so that we could run back to him. I'm gonna invite the ushers to come forward if they would, if they'd walk all the way down to the front and then turn around. If you didn't receive communion when you walked in and you wanna participate, just raise your hand. We offer open communion. That means you don't have to be a member here. This could be your first time. You don't have to have gone to a special class. If you would like to remember what Jesus did for you, we invite you to participate. Just wave, wave your hand and we'll make sure that we get everybody served. Same thing on the patio. I know people are walking around. If you're at home, just run to the pantry, grab some crackers, some juice, wine, kind of whatever you got there, and uh, feel free to participate with us. Make sure we get everybody served. Communion is this opportunity to remember how valuable we are to God. This is what God paid for your freedom, for your forgiveness. The body and the blood of Christ. That's how loved we are. All right, once you get those in your hand, would everybody stand with me? Everybody in the room, everybody outside, if you would stand. And here's what I want us to do. I want to take a moment of silent prayer, reflection, just kind of right there in your seat. And I want to ask you a couple of questions. In this moment, do you need to right-size your fear? And do you need to say, Lord, help me fear you more than I do my circumstances? And again, not to be scared of the Lord. What is the fear of the Lord? A joyful awe and wonder at the greatness of who God is and what he has done. So let's come to communion and say, God, we have a joyful awe and wonder that you loved me even in my sin, even when I was running from you, even when I didn't know you. Wow, what a good God we have. Do you need to right-size that fear? Or do you need to choose to believe what the Lord says about you, that you're valuable? It's not about how successful you are at that business right now. It's not about what you did or what you didn't do. God values you. He wants to be in a relationship with you. You can run to him, not away. And maybe you're here today and you would say, you know what, I've been running from God and today's your day to come back home. Come back into relationship with your creator. Then in this moment of silence, just in your own head and heart, just say a prayer that says, Jesus, I choose you. I believe in you and I say yes to you. Let's take a moment of silent personal prayer and then I'll lead us in eating the bread and drinking the cup all together in just a moment. Let's pray. If you would, just go ahead and open that first little plastic layer, get the bread in your hand. We're remembering how loved we are by God. In the very first communion, Jesus took bread, broke it, passed it among his disciples, said, this is my body broken for you. Let's eat the bread and remember how loved we are by our Savior. Next, if you'll open the cup. Christ took a cup of wine, passed it among his friends, said this cup represents a new covenant. That simply means a new promise. No longer did they have to sacrifice goats and lambs or sparrows for their sins, but Jesus was going to be the once and for all perfect sacrifice for all sin. Let's drink the cup and worship our Savior together. I'm gonna say a prayer for us and then uh, we're gonna worship through one last song. And if you're new to church and you're like, man, why do they sing all the time? Um, these are prayers. And this is a great prayer that we chose at the end of the service today on purpose. The title of the song says, God, I look to you. That's what we're doing when we fear the Lord. When we fear the Lord and life and circumstances aren't going our way, we're choosing to see him first and then our problems and our persecution and our struggles second. And so this song says, God, I look to you. I won't be overwhelmed. Like, give me vision to see things like you do. And so let's make this our prayer. If you're not a big singer, that's fine. Just pray the words, because that's what these are. They're prayers. 
So let's look to God. And then I'm going to come back. Something we're going to do for the next five weeks of this series is uh, we're going to pray a different blessing at the end of each service uh, over everyone. So a special benediction. So uh, let's worship through this closing song. Then I'll come back and pray that blessing. Here, you're present, you love us. And in this moment where we pray these words, we sing this song, may it be real. God, may we look to you. May we fear you more than we do the things of this world. And may we know how loved we are by you. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.